Have you ever heard of the Maid of Lorraine prophecies or Joan of Arc? A woman whose accomplishments and prophecies became legend in her own lifetime. Well, she sure was a peculiar woman, so let's gossip a little bit about her, okay? Welcome to Peculiar Occurrences. I am your host, Lilith Nova. A peculiar occurrence fan? Well, I've opened up a store just for you. So head on over and buy your peculiar occurrence gear today. Links are in the description box below. Thank you. This episode was suggested by Blur's Completely Complicated Life. After about a hundred years of war, France was devastated from the English's use of scorch earth tactics, making their grounds unable to grow food. And with their merchants being cut off from foreign markets, France was devastated and nearly fallen to England. Rumors started to rage about a prophecy where France would be lost by a woman and regained by a virgin from the borders of Lorraine, yielding weaponry to take back France from English forces. These prophecies were called the Maiden of Lorraine Prophecies. In 1420, the Queen of France signed the Treaty of Troy, which granted succession of France to the heirs of King Henry V of England, instead of to her son, Prince Charles the Seventh. King Henry V and King Charles the Sixth both died only two months apart from each other in 1422, leaving a infant Henry the Sixth as monarch of both kingdoms. King Henry V's brother, John of Lancaster, first Duke of Bedford, acted as the regent. A woman had devastatedly signed France away to England. And after this, in 1429, nearly all of France was taken by English and anglo burgundian forces. They controlled Paris and Rouen, along with Reims, which was important because the Cathedral of Reims was the traditional coronation site for the past French king since the year 816. Neither heir had been officially coronated as king, so Charles VII still had a chance to become king. In 1428, the English had started the Siege of Orleans, one of the few st cities left that were still loyal to Charles VII. Also an important objective because they were the only thing standing in the way of English making a full-on attack to the heart of France. In the words of one modern historian, on the fate of Orleans hung the fate of the entire kingdom. No one was optimistic that the city could long withstand the siege. Then in flew Joan of Arc. So no, what? How did they get through? I, I don't know. I've heard that the captain possesses some wonderful power. What's his name? Who is he? She. I am Joan of Arc. Your humble servant. Born January 6, 1412, a nickname the Maiden of or Orleans, a woman who often dressed as a man to protect herself along her long journeys. She quickly became the heroine of France for her row during the Lancastrian phase of the Hundred Year War. Joan of Arc was born to a peasant family in northeastern France. Joan claimed that she received visions from Archangel Michael, Saint Margaret, and Saint Catherine of Alexandria, instructing her to support Charles VII and recover France from English domination late in the Hundred Year War. The uncrowned King Charles VII sent Joan to the Siege of Orleans as part of a relief mission. She gained prominence when just after nine days of her being there, the siege was lifted. 
several additional swift victories led to Charles VII being coronated at the Cathedral of Reims. This long-awaited period boosted French morale and paved the way for the final French victory. On May 23rd, 1430, she was captured by Burgundian forces, which were allied with the English. She was then turned over to the English and put on trial for heresy by a pro-English bishop, to where she was found guilty and burned at the stake. She died at about 19 years old. In 1456, an inquisitional court examined the charges, found her innocent, and deemed her a martyr. In the 16th century, she became the symbol of the Catholic League. In 1803, she was declared a national symbol of France by Napoleon Bonaparte. Then she was canonized and became a saint in 1902. She is one of only nine patriot saints of France. Now let's get into the more peculiar part of this story, how she became known as the Maid of Lorraine. Well, first, there was the actual Maiden of Lorraine prophecies that everyone had heard for quite some time before her birth. Since Joan's village was near Lorraine, a lot of people believed in her. Joan claimed to receive visions from God, and she passed every test laid before her. Joan of Arc's prophecies became legendary in her own time, corroborated by witnesses and testimony. Joan prophetically charged herself with four responsibilities, only two of which were realized in her lifetime. She once said to Prince Charles VII, I shall last a year and but little longer. We must think to do good, work in that time. Four things are laid upon me to drive out the English, to bring you to be crowned and anointed at Reims, to rescue the Duke of Orleans from the hands of the English, and to raise the siege of Orleans. End quote. Now let's look at the four prophetic responsibilities. Number one, to drive out the English. Despite all the extraordinary accomplishments of Joan of Arc, she was executed before this prophecy was fully realized. She was the sole inspiration for driving out English forces from most of France. However, it wasn't until November 12, 1437, six years and eight months after her death, that Henry VI lost Paris, and historians recognize the English as being driven from France. Joan was responsible for this like no one else could have possibly been. For it was her great deeds that helped lead the French to recapture their land. Number two, to crown and anoint Charles VII at Reims Cathedral. Sometime in March of 1429, Joan professed to Charles VII that in four months he would be crowned the King of France at Reims Cathedral. This claim is actually verified in a letter, dated April 22nd, 1429, states, the king in the course of the coming summer would be crowned at Reims. Charles VII was crowned in Reims. Charles VII was crowned in Reims Cathedral on July 17th, 1429 with Joan of Arc by his side strategically this was a devastating blow to the English number three to rescue the Duke of Orleans from the hands of the English Duke Charles de Orleans fell into the hands of the English at the disastrous French defeat of Agincourt in 1415 lifting the English siege in Orleans paved the way to his release but it wasn't until 1440, nine years after Joan's death, that he was freed. Number four, to raise the siege of Orleans. The city of Orleans had been besieged for at least seven months before Joan's arrival. On April 29th, 1429, Jacques Donos, the bastard of Orleans, 
was unsuccessful at turning the English away. John Talbot, the Earl Sh Shrewberry, considered one of the most audacious of the English generals, commanded the garrisons, and occupied one of the most formidable fortresses, St. Luke. Joan led the capture of St. Luke on May 4th, her very first day of battle, and then she swore not to battle, fight, or put on armor the next day, the day of the ascension. Instead, she sternly warned the enemy with a note fastened to an arrow that she shot into enemy lines. She wrote, You Englishmen who have no right in this kingdom of France, the King of Heaven sends you word and warning by me, Johan the Maiden, to abandon your forts, depart into your own country. Or I will raise such a war cry against you as shall be remembered forever. And this I write to you for the third and last time, nor shall I write further. On May 6th, Joan exclaimed, In the name of God, let us go on bravely! And proceeded to capture the English fortress of the Augustians. That evening, she requested that her chaplain stay close to her. The next day, she then prophesied, Tomorrow, blood will flow from my body above my breast. Joan was the first to set a ladder against the fortress on May 7th, and indeed she was wounded by a crossbow in the shoulder. Upon her return to the battlefield, French soldiers were inspired to capture the bridge and stronghold of Les Trois, imminently sealing the fate of the English. On May 8th, the siege was lifted. Thus, it was that three days of battle over the course of four days that lifted the seven-month siege of Orleans. Joan of Arc's first military victory was her first battle. Now let's talk about other prophecies Joan had given besides her main objectives. Number one, the French defeat. With pressure building for Joan to begin her mission, she pronounced to the captain of the town of Varlouse that the French military had suffered a great defeat near the city of Orleans. This was on the day of the battle, in which the battlefield was said to be so far away there was no way she could have got a messenger pigeon or anything else of that matter. A few days later, the official message arrived with the news, which later became known as the Battle of Herring. The captain then granted Joan modest resources to begin her journey to convince Charles VII that she was on a divine mission. Number two, find the king. Hearing of a young farm girl from Lorraine arriving to crown him king, Charles VII sought to test her. Charles set up a test for when she arrived, there was a fake sitting on his throne and a lavish party going on where Charles hid amongst the regular folk. Joan of Arc approached the throne and immediately became upset and demanded to speak with the real Charles VII, where she was told, well, find him out of the room. She looked around the room and quickly found Charles VII. Once she found him, she whispered into his ear and went off into a room with him. No one to this day knows what was said between the two. But after speaking to her, Charles VII's faith was strong for Joan. He gave her an army and war horses and whatever it was that she needed. Number three, her sword. Joan proclaimed to be divinely informed on the whereabouts of a sword after taking mass three times in one day. She sent for a sword that was supposed to be in the church of St. Catherine, Diphobos. I know I didn't say that right. I'm so sorry. The sword was supposed to be hidden behind the altar. Immediately, those looking for it found the sword. It was all rusted over. When asked how she knew that the sword was there, she answered that the sword was in the ground. It was rusted over, and it had five crosses on it. 
and she knew it was there through her voices and that she had never seen the man who fetched it for her. She wrote to the clergy of the church and asked if it was their pleasure that she should have the sword and they sent it to her. As soon as the priest found the sword, as soon as the sword was found, the priest rubbed it and the rust fell off with no effort. Number four, her own capture. In March of 1429, Jones said to Charles VII, I shall last a year and but a little longer. We must think to do good work in that year. Later she elaborated by saying she would be captured by Midsummer Day, June 24th, but that she did not know the exact time. Before the Battle of Orleans, Joan was noted as saying, I feel nothing but treachery. Fourteen months later, May 23rd, 1430, Joan prayed at one of the churches. Her spirit was troubled as she reportedly told a group of children, Pray for me for I have been betrayed. That evening she went with a company of soldiers outside the city against the English. After crossing a bridge, the English intercepted her and her men, cutting off their retreat. Refusing the demands to surrender, Joan was pulled off her horse by a Burgundian archer and taken prisoner. Number five, wounded in New Orleans, which I've already touched on this, but a letter dated April 22nd, 1429, reads, The maid said she would save Orleans, compel the English to raise the siege, and that she herself would be wounded by a shaft that would not die of it, and that the king, in the course of the coming summer, would be crowned at Reims. At her trial of rehabilitation, Father Jean Pasquil, I know I said that wrong, my bad, testified on May 6th, 1429, that Joan said, Tomorrow, blood shall flow from my body above my breast. On May 7th, 1429, Joan of Arc led the attack on the English and was wounded through the shoulder by a crossbow, which I know I already mentioned. Number six, seven years. In March 1431, at her trial of condemnation, Joan of Arc announced that within seven years that the English would suffer a far greater defeat than they had in Orleans, losing everything in France. On November 12th, 1437, Six years and eight months after Joan's declaration, Henry VI lost Paris, and historians recognize the English as being driven from France. Number seven, predicting a man's death. Father Jean Perquil, I can't say that name. Father Jean Pasquel told of a man that Joan heard curse and was told by her. You dare curse God? You, who are so near to death. An hour later, he fell into water and died. Were Joan of Arc's voices ever wrong? Often during her imprisonment, Joan talked of her expectations of deliverance, though she didn't know how or when this would come about. Several people testified that when she realized that her deliverance wouldn't be forthcoming, that she started to say that her voices had deceived her. If she did say this, it is uncertain what she meant. Though testimonies at her trial of condemnment speak a different story. Statements saying that until her last breath, she declared her voices came from God and never deceived her. Joan reported that her voices had told her, Have no care for they martyrdom. You will in the end come to the kingdom of paradise. It seems she may have contradicted herself here. Her voices were deceptive. It lays doubt over all her claims of divine communication. Did God lie? It was apparent that for a time Joan believed she would be delivered from captivity, stating, Those who wish to get me out of the world 
might well proceed being saved. Joan of Arc may have even interpreted her being a martyr as to mean what she had to endure in prison. Many believe that it was this interpretation of the voices that made Joan of Arc feel like she had been deceived and that later in reflection she no longer felt this way. Though it is clear that in the end she held fast to what the voices had told her and declared them to be the faithful word of God. There is so many theories about this. From she heard the word of God to her being a witch that consorted with the devil. Some even think that she was the illegitimate sister of Charles VII and a fine trickster who got inside information. Modern psychologists with a fascination of her stories say that she may have had some sort of disorder like schizophrenia that caused her to have delusions. What do you think about the stories of Joan of Arc and which theory is your favorite? Let me know down in the comments below. And while you're down there, the link to my merch store is in the description box below. If you would like one of these peculiar occurrences shirts. Peculiar occurrence. Be peculiar. Or you can pick up one of my newly popular uh, Peculiar Squad shirts. Until next time, keep your eyes peeled for all things peculiar. Are you listening? Damn. Yeah.